The delineation of comic book history into specific ages is intrinsically tied to the superhero genre. This mainly occurs because that genre is directly associated with comic books. After all, it was the creation of superheroes that made a new medium unique and distinct from its newspaper origins. Of course, superheroes haven't always been the dominant genre, but they have been a steady presence since the very beginning of the medium. So it's no surprise that notable events in superhero history are what begins certain comic book ages. These are somewhat arbitrary points, but there is a reasoning behind them. There are other influential events that directly or indirectly affected the evolution of comic books from a primarily juvenile medium to its current state as a respectable method of artistic expression. Instead of focusing on one genre and its impact, this will contain many of the notable or significant developments of the medium. The main characteristic of this period is the creation of the comic book format. Prior to this, in the early 20th century, the medium was developing. Generally speaking, early comics were satirical pictorials with sequential panels. This eventually transformed into the recognizable newspaper strip format. These newspaper strips were eventually collected and published in a tabloid format that would become comic books. Originally, these tabloid compilations were inserted into newspapers and given away for free. The first collection that was sold on its own was Famous Funnies from 1933. This is usually recognized as the first actual comic book. It contained reprinted newspaper strips and some original material. Again, it was preceded by many other similarly formatted tabloids, but this comic is distinguished by the fact that it was sold separately as opposed to being a newspaper insert. The first comic book with all original material was New Fun Comics No. 1 from 1935. This comic was the first comic published by National Periodicals, the company that would eventually become known as DC. Of all the ages, the beginning of this age is indisputable. It begins with the publication of Action Comics No. 1 in 1938. The significance of this comic is known by anyone who knows anything about comic books. This is the first appearance of Superman. More importantly, it created an entirely new genre, superheroics. Certainly, prior to this, there were individuals with uncanny abilities, Doc Savage and the Shadow being easy examples. At first, the difference between uncanny abilities and superheroics may seem like splitting hairs, and that would be a fair assessment. After all, Superman was just very strong, impervious to bullets, and he could jump large distances. In time, though, the differences would become more pronounced. More to the point, Superman inspired the creation of other heroes with equally super abilities. This character inspired others to elaborate on the concept of extraordinary, fantastical powers. To begin with, there are a few defining features of this age. It was an entirely new medium where anything was possible. As such, there was no language, so to speak. This aspect would develop over the next decade and it would be refined in the decades that followed. Page layouts and panel arrangements would be integrated with words and individual illustrations to form a cohesive narrative technique. The work done by the Will Eisner and Jerry Iger studio is usually cited as an example of this language developing, as is the work produced by Jack Kirby and Joe Simon. Although one cannot overlook the work of Osama Tezuka, the prolific manga artist best known for creating Astro Boy. His work would influence many creators worldwide. Another feature was a proliferation of genres. Everything popular on the radio or in the movies became represented in the new medium. It was a visual explosion of variety and diversification. Horror, romance, crime, funny animals, western, and war. Following the end of World War II, superheroes began to fall out of fashion. Other genres, especially crime and horror, soared in popularity. The most popular crime comic, Crime Does Not Pay, boasted a circulation of 2 million copies monthly. Which didn't mean they sold 2 million copies. It meant that 2 million people read each issue. Its actual sales were roughly a million and a half copies monthly. This is a number that's on par with the best-selling superhero titles like Superman and Captain Marvel during the early 40s. Anecdotally, Crime Does Not Pay had a sell-through rate of 100%. Whatever they printed got sold, even if it was a misprinted or damaged copy. In contrast, most best-selling titles had a sell-through rate between roughly 65 and 80%. Whether those numbers are accurate or not is unknown. Regardless, crime comics did very well. The Golden Age was an innocent time in some respects. 
The end of its innocence was when the medium was codified as strictly juvenile entertainment. This was initiated by the publication of Seduction of the Innocent in 1954. The unfounded accusations and the sloppy, intentionally misleading conclusions proposed by Dr. Wortham were popularly accepted and endorsed. Hysteria ensued. The result being, the medium was infantilized and heavily censored for the next two decades. Significantly, the censorship board, the Comics Code Authority, was established. The mandate of this board was to ensure comic books remained a sanitary form of entertainment for children. To that end, if a comic didn't meet their standards and receive their approval, distributors wouldn't ship the comic to newsstands. The two genres that were specifically targeted were horror and crime. The restrictions placed on those two genres essentially ensured they wouldn't receive comics code approval. As a result, these genres were neutered and their appeal rapidly diminished. To give one a sense of the impact the comics code had on the industry, prior to the code, there were roughly 20 comic book publishers. Within the first few years of the code being implemented, that number dropped to eight. The most notable casualty was EC, Entertaining Comics. This company produced some of the most challenging, thought-provoking material during its brief existence. EC had a quality that was consistent and noticeably different than all other contemporary publishers. When the comics code was drafted, the publisher, Max Gaines Jr., claimed the restrictions were specifically targeted at EC in an effort to neutralize and destroy the publisher. At a glance, this accusation appears to have some truth. Regardless, EC was unable to make the change to more sanitary comic book material. However, by utilizing the magazine format, which was outside the purview of the comics code, EC transformed into the highly successful publisher of Mad Magazine. The consensus concerning the beginning of the Silver Age is the publication of Showcase No. 4 in October 1956. This issue introduced the modern Barry Allen version of The Flash. The reasoning behind this demarcation point is, a Golden Age character was repurposed for a modern audience. Reportedly, it was the first popular superhero concept since, roughly, the 1940s. In other words, The Flash proved the public was still interested in superheroes. Objectively, the beginning of the Silver Age should be the publication of Fantastic Four No. 1 in 1961. The obvious impact of this comic far exceeds the impact of Showcase No. 4. One could make a reasonably strong case for the Brave and Bold No. 28, the first appearance of the Justice League of America. Like The Flash, this was a repurposed concept from the Golden Age, one that also proved to be quite successful, and its success directly led to the creation of the Fantastic Four. However, logically, without the publication of The Flash first, the Justice League might not have been published. And the Fantastic Four might never have existed, since they were allegedly created to capitalize on the Justice League's success. So the reintroduction of The Flash started a chain of events that led to superheroes flourishing once again. Historically speaking, the Silver Age is the new age of superheroes. The genre once again became relevant, and it took a small step forward into maturity. Again, this is heavily personified by the newly established Marvel Comics. Instead of creating stories for children, Marvel aimed for teenagers. Overall, Marvel added a layer of realism or relatability to their characters. Or, to quote Stan Lee, the only actual employee of Marvel Comics in 1961, these were heroes with feet of clay. They may have performed incredible feats, but at the end of the day, they were also very human. This feature, superpowers, and a recognizable character trait or flaw would be the standard approach for all Marvel characters. To quote former Marvel editor Mark Gruenwald, Marvel Comics were 10% more realistic than DC. That was their appeal. Marvel was just as sensational and dynamic as DC, but the characters and situations felt more real. Whereas, DC characters were basically superpowered in all aspects of their life. They were too perfect. The 60s also gave rise to underground comics. While there had been intermittent adult material, especially in counterculture magazines, the publication of Zap No. 1 in 1968 was a touchstone moment. For whatever reason, this comic galvanized the movement and inspired a variety of underground comic book publishers to emerge. While undergrounds are essentially extinct today, the creative freedom they personified is still alive and well in traditional and non-traditional publishing platforms. One slightly overlooked aspect of the Silver Age is the early beginnings of alternative comics. Marvel and DC were mainstream, producing content for a primarily young audience. The undergrounds were on the other side of that spectrum, with content that was adult 
and, at times, controversial due to its depiction of sex, violence, and drug use. Alternative comics sat somewhere between these two extremes. In other words, alternative comics were adult-themed, but they contained a certain level of restraint. Unfortunately, there was no distribution model in place for content of this nature, and these early efforts, primarily by the writer-slash-artist Wally Wood, gained no traction. In a similar alternative comics vein, there was the output of Warren Publishing. Using the loophole pioneered by Mad Magazine, Warren produced horror magazines that were exempt from the restrictions of the comics code. They also had widespread mainstream distribution, like Marvel and DC. However, Warren did struggle in its early years. The creation of the campy hostess, Vampirella, in 1969, gave the publisher some notoriety and the company would have a consistent presence through the next decade. Finding a definitive beginning to the Bronze Age is a heavily debated topic, and for good reason. A lot happened in a very short amount of time. Marvel began publishing Conan the Barbarian in 1970, the first of many licensed properties the company would publish. In 1971, they also published the three-part Green Goblin Reborn, which focused on drug addiction. In 1970, DC began publishing the acclaimed Green Lantern Green Arrow series by Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams. This was a series that also dealt with drug addiction and a variety of social issues. At the same time, Jack Kirby left Marvel Comics and began his fourth world epic at DC. Finally, in 1971, the Comics Code was revised to allow for overt supernatural elements to be depicted in the medium once again. Of all the developments that define the beginning of this era, this may be the most important. Although, one can't overlook the events that preceded this revision because they certainly had an influence on it. Without Marvel and DC pushing back against the restrictions, they might not have been relaxed. With the revised code in place, both Marvel and DC began expanding the variety of their output to include previously forbidden elements. Perhaps Marvel was the boldest, creating characters such as the demonic Ghost Rider, the science-based vampire, Morbius, the muck-encrusted monstrosity, Man-Thing, and the literal Son of Satan, to name but a few examples. Eventually, DC would try to challenge Marvel's dominance on the newsstand with something called the DC Explosion. They aggressively published a variety of new titles between 1975 and 1978, hoping to crush their rival with new concepts and a higher profile. Unfortunately, interest in comics had waned, and this approach almost destroyed DC. In 1978, DC abruptly cancelled roughly 40% of its titles in an event known as the DC Implosion. It was a reasonably unstable time for the company. However, Marvel was in no position to gloat. Not only were their sales equally dismal, but the company had been running wild without a consistent editor-in-chief since 1972. The publisher wasn't in dire straits like their rival, but it was functioning without a direction. This would change in 1978, when Jim Shooter was hired as editor-in-chief. In retrospect, this controversial figure was exactly what Marvel needed as the company headed into the 80s. He instituted changes that stabilized the company and expanded its presence. But, to some, he was a micromanaging dictator with a narrow view of how to produce a comic. This led to a certain amount of creative talent vocally leaving Marvel and begin working for DC. Another defining feature of this age is the beginning stages of a discussion around creators' rights. Since the inception of the industry, artists and writers were merely hired hands. Everything they did was owned outright by the companies they worked for. This was in stark contrast to nearly every other publishing venture where the creator of the work owned the rights to the material they produced. The change began when the highly successful artist, Neil Adams, discovered that the creators of Superman, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, were living in poverty. The two people who had created the most influential character in the history of comics did not share in that success. They were treated as nobodies due to the fact that they had tried to legally reacquire their rights to Superman in the late 60s. It was further discovered they had originally been coerced into signing away their rights without legal counsel. It was a very shady deal that, unfortunately, had been upheld in a court of law. Adams brought Siegel and Schuster's story to the public. He was rather vocal about their deplorable state of affairs and how they had been mistreated by DC. With a big-budget Superman movie in production, DC had to manage this negative press. Over at Marvel, Steve Gerber, the creator of Howard the Duck, pursued legal action to decide the ownership of that character, 
at roughly the same time. Jack Kirby also began negotiations to have his artwork returned to him from the Marvel archives. Gerber would eventually lose his case, and Kirby would spend the next decade legally arguing with Marvel to obtain his artwork. These three instances are very complex and very convoluted, and they were public matters that were adjudicated by the court of popular opinion, but they contributed to opening a discussion about creators' rights, and most importantly, to provide compensation for the creators if their work became popular and profitable. Finally, the Bronze Age included three important interrelated elements, the opening of comic book specialty stores, the creation of direct market distribution, and the return of alternative comics. In the beginning stages, all three depended on one another. With this new model, alternative comics such as Star Reach, ElfQuest, and Cerebus could get their material to an audience since traditional distribution wasn't available to them. Comic book stores had a direct method of obtaining the product to sustain their business, and the distributors had a growing market to distribute to. What made this model successful and gave incentive to Marvel and DC to use this method was the fact that every issue ordered was a guaranteed sale. With traditional distribution, newsstands could return whatever they ordered if it didn't sell. Comic book stores did not have that option. In return, comic book stores paid a lower price for the comics they ordered. Also, the direct market didn't require approval of the Comics Code Authority for the titles it carried. Unofficially, the direct market would reject titles if they were deemed objectionable, but there was no official censorship board monitoring every title, so its decisions could be, at times, inconsistent. The early 80s is when the direct market began to rapidly inflate. New publishers, such as Pacific Comics, First Comics, Eclipse, and Kamiko, started up and found success. In 1984, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles began, and an explosion of black and white titles followed many of which had an anthropomorphic spin like the Turtles. Regardless, the success of the Turtles brought attention to alternative titles, and readers became more willing to try out unproven works by new talent. The black and white explosion may have been brief, but its effect was long-lasting. At the same time, Marvel and DC were tentatively testing the market with direct market exclusive titles. When very healthy orders came in for these exclusive titles, both began to commit to this new model. In fact, Marvel committed heavily, leading to many of the smaller publishers complaining that Marvel was trying to drown them out with an avalanche of new material. That is, with Marvel's notoriety and their wide selection of titles, they would have a larger presence in comic book stores. And a store was more likely to order a Marvel comic due to its general appeal, rather than an alternative comic with a limited audience. Not to mention, a reader might overlook a new alternative title because it was buried between dozens of Marvel comics. While Marvel denied these accusations, this was exactly what they were doing. They were asserting their dominance over both the smaller publishers and their chief rival, DC. Worth mentioning is comic book magazines. During the latter part of the 70s, Warren Publishing did well with Creepy, Eerie, and the solo Vampirella title. DC seemed to avoid this market, but Marvel embraced it. They launched a series of black and white titles, such as The Savage Sword of Conan, The Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, Rampaging Hulk, and the Mad Magazine ripoff, Crazy. For the most part, these Marvel magazines were simply longer, slightly more mature versions of their color comics. They included healthy amounts of cleavage or the occasional exposed breast, but otherwise, they were practically the same as their comic books. In 1977, Heavy Metal launched and changed the comic book magazine landscape. Its slick production value and adult-oriented stories were a reasonably massive hit. Marvel made its own attempt at a high-quality adult magazine with Epic Illustrated. Rampaging Hulk was also upgraded to color. The stories became more mature, and they were written to attract the audience that was watching the popular TV show. By the early 80s, Warren Publishing went out of business, and Marvel closed down its magazine line. The Epic Illustrated brand would carry on in the form of Epic Comics, a creator-owned selection of traditional comics. Also worth a brief mention is the rise and fall of licensed comics, many of which were tie-ins to merchandise such as toys. This was another area mostly avoided by DC, but openly embraced by Marvel. There seemed to be no toy or property Marvel wouldn't make into a comic. The most notable is Star Wars. The success of that comic seemed to invigorate Marvel's dedication to licensed properties. While that franchise outlived the Marvel comic, as did the Transformers and G.I. Joe, the opposite was true of many other properties. The Human Fly lasted longer than the career of the stuntman it was based upon. Rom Space Knight and the Micronauts lasted years longer than the associated toy line. 
Godzilla, Shogun Warriors, and Battlestar Galactica were all short-lived like their associated trend. Naturally, there were licensed properties during the Golden and Silver Age too, and it's something that exists in present day. But it was during the Bronze Age when they seemed to be everywhere all at once, and they were specifically created to capitalize on and generate interest in specific merchandise. Some argue the modern age should be broken down into a few separate parts, such as the Dark Age, or the Copper Age, or the Plastic Age, or the Postmodern Age. There is no shortage of opinion or debate on this matter, but there is no consensus. Like the Bronze Age, the Modern Age has a beginning point that's debatable, but it's generally centered around one event, Crisis on Infinite Earths. Crisis erased 50 years of DC continuity, simplified the DC universe, and it led to a reboot of nearly all the company's titles. It was such a pivotal event, DC has attempted to recapture that lightning multiple times since. Most notably, in 2005 with Infinite Crisis, and then Final Crisis in 2008, and Flashpoint in 2011, followed by New 52 in the same year, and then Rebirth in 2016 none of which were as influential or successful as the event that inspired them. Regardless, the defining feature of the beginning of the modern age may be one word, deconstruction, specifically the deconstruction of superheroes, although the strict definition of that word might not apply. What is generally meant is that superheroes got serious, or to use a term frequently used, things got grim and gritty. The serious trend was kicked off by the publication of both The Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen by DC, although Marvel also published Squadron Supreme, a 12-issue series that dealt with superheroes taking control and attempting to create a utopia. Thematically, they are all somewhat similar, but Squadron Supreme takes a classic approach to the concept of the superhero, with ideals that are, to a degree, basic and understandable. In Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns, characterizations and motivations are rather murky, Put another way, Dark Knight and Watchmen are more mature, layered, and openly question the role of a superhero. The influence of Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns on the superhero genre is undeniable, and these works gave the medium itself a level of prestige. They weren't the only serious works being produced during this time, but they were the two pieces with the highest profile by a major publisher. In a general sense, when the dominant genre of the medium, superheroes, began to be taken seriously, the medium itself began to be taken seriously by the general public. Another defining feature of the modern age is the event comic. Event comics are usually centered around a short miniseries published as oversized issues. The premise of that miniseries is then expanded upon in regular, ongoing series. More often than not, these tie-ins were not essential whatsoever. For the most part, tie-ins merely filled in minor plot beats from the event storyline. However, these insignificant bits did have the effect of temporarily raising a title's sales, so these tie-ins became more and more common over time. Unlike modern times, the event comics of the late 80s and early 90s were usually published in the summer. This was to capitalize on the fact that their main audience was out of school and needed entertainment during the vacation season. Again, more often than not, these were blockbuster stories that usually had no impact on the ongoing titles once the story concluded. Certainly, there were exceptions, but the effect was usually limited to a few titles, not an entire product line. Events would go extinct when the comic book market crashed circa 1995 and then be revived in the early 2000s. However, these events had evolved. An event now included all titles from a publisher, were usually published over a lengthy amount of time, and they began at any point during a calendar year. Additionally, the effects of the event would be an ongoing feature of the publisher's fictional universe, or multiverse, whatever the case may be. Perhaps the most well-known aspect of the modern age is the sudden increase in popularity for comics and its acceptance as a valid form of artistic expression and as a form of entertainment, not just for children, but for adults too. Due to a variety of factors, comic books attained a high profile during the late 80s and early 90s. The grim and gritty trend, along with the proliferation of other, more literate material, began to dispel the notion that the art form was strictly juvenile entertainment. The general public embraced comic books once again, and sales skyrocketed, as did the cost of back issues. All of this snowballed into the perception that comic books, all comic books, were a healthy, worthwhile investment. This turned out to be untrue, specifically for current titles. Many, many people soon discovered that investing in hot new titles was a disappointing venture, 
As a result, sales began to drop, and then they dropped even further. Smaller publishers closed their doors, and many comic book stores went out of business. The latter half of the 90s was a new period of uncertainty for the industry. The big two, Marvel and DC, did their best to remain solvent. DC managed to stabilize. Marvel, which had become a publicly traded company in 1991, declared bankruptcy and spent the better part of a decade getting stable once again. Just before this dark period, seven creators joined together to form their own publishing company, Image Comics. Its success and influence practically defines the early 90s. Image was primarily dedicated to the seven founders and their work. However, other well-known artists were invited into the fold once the company was established. Despite displaying unity in the press, disagreements between the founders quickly emerged. One founder, Rob Liefeld, was removed in 1996, and another founder, Jim Lee, sold his studio to DC in 1999. The loss of two founders and the terrible state of the industry forced the publisher to diversify. This led to a variety of unknown or unproven talent being published at Image. Quite possibly, allowing outsiders to use Image as a publishing platform may have saved the company from dissolving entirely. Currently, Image Comics is the premier publisher for established and new talent to create and own their material. Self-contained universes became a popular publishing tactic during the modern age. Perhaps the most notable was CrossGen, which launched with a series of titles in 1998 that were seemingly unrelated, but all took place within a shared universe. However, there were many more examples. In fact, the early aforementioned Image Comics were a loose, poorly defined shared universe. Valiant Comics, an imprint established by Jim Shooter after he was fired from Marvel, launched a series of titles mainly based on older Gold Key properties. Ironically, Shooter was fired by his investors, and he went on to create Defiant Comics. This was another shared universe approach, but it failed almost as soon as it launched. Malibu Comics, who made a considerable amount of money being Image Comics' first publisher, launched their own universe in 1993, the Ultraverse. The publisher would be subsequently bought out by Marvel in 1994. Dark Horse also attempted their own shared universe in 1994 with Comics' Greatest World. These were some reasonably successful titles, but it slowly faded out of existence within a few years. For the record, CrossGen went bankrupt in 2004, and all its properties were purchased by Disney. Disney then purchased Marvel in 2009. So like Malibu, all CrossGen titles are owned by Marvel. In recent years, the Valiant universe has re-emerged and continues to present day. Both Marvel and DC would experiment with imprints that were more adult and creator-friendly. Epic Comics allowed creators to retain their rights, but functionally became extinct by 1990. This was possibly due to the fact that the publishing lineup never established an identity, nor did it have a massive hit. Some titles, such as Dreadstar, did well, but sales were nothing compared to Marvel's mainstream lineup. In 1993, DC established Vertigo Comics, an imprint that initially published the offbeat titles DC had offered. Vertigo had the benefit of beginning with well-known, highly regarded series such as Sandman, Swamp Thing, Hellblazer, Doom Patrol, and Animal Man, all of which had a distinct superhero flavor. Over time, the lineup would expand and the superhero element diminished in favor of the supernatural. Vertigo developed a creator-friendly environment that allowed for more adult content. Like all publishing ventures in the 90s, its sales were not great, but it maintained a level of prestige and became a reasonably good place for new talent to explore new concepts. Unfortunately, by the mid-2000s, Image Comics had taken Vertigo's place in the comic book market. In 2020, Vertigo was officially shuttered and replaced with DC Black Label, an imprint that explores darker superhero-based stories. During the early 90s, newsstand distribution was phased out. Direct market distribution became the only manner of distribution for all comic book companies. This factor, along with the acceptance that comics were a diverse field, offering a variety of content for both young people and adults, led to the comics code finally ending. The censorship board was closed, and publishers instituted their own internal rating system. Despite being effectively useless since the early 90s, the Comics Code wasn't shut down completely until 2011. Ironically, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, a non-profit organization that was founded to defend comic books deemed as obscene, purchased the intellectual property rights to the Comics Code. 
in other words, the infamous seal of approval, is now owned by an organization that defended work the Comics Code would have never approved. During the modern age, reprints of previously published material, often referred to as trade paperbacks, began to become a common practice. Initially, hard-to-find stories were collected in one volume, as opposed to issuing a second or third print of the original issues. Over time, this developed into all storylines of all titles, being collected shortly after a story arc was complete. This allowed comics to expand their presence to bookstores and to libraries. In current day, the term graphic novel is a shorthand phrase that refers to these trade paperbacks, although the strict definition of the term graphic novel doesn't actually apply to trade paperbacks. That term specifically refers to work that is complete. That is, the story, or a collection of short stories, have a definitive beginning, middle, and end, like a traditional novel. The aforementioned Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns conform to this definition, despite originally being serialized. However, most current graphic novels are chapters in a never-ending story. Like graphic novels, manga began to slowly but surely increase its presence in North America, primarily in collected, digest editions. The appeal and influence of manga on North American comics is vast. In many ways, their popularity is due to being an alternative to mainstream superhero content, which is the dominant genre in North America. Manga also has a distinct appeal to young adults, which was a market every form of media targeted during the 90s after the popularity of the Harry Potter series. In the new millennium, the comic book industry began to noticeably change. This was mainly due to three factors the corporatization of publishers, the movie industry, and the proliferation of the internet. DC had almost always been a subsidiary of a parent company, and Marvel Comics attained that distinction in 2009. The two most popular companies had become, as some might say, intellectual property farms for multimedia conglomerates. Their identity is attached to the characters they own, rather than the style of comic they produce. Although it should be noted, being an intellectual property farm is not limited to these two companies. In modern times, most, if not all, publishers have established themselves with the foreknowledge that their comic books are properties. That is, the comic book material is a launching pad to licensing concepts to movies and TV. This is due, in part, to the rise of superhero movies and their widespread appeal. Notably, this is also extended to TV shows on streaming services. Movies and TV have given niche or obscure characters such as Deadpool, Guardians of the Galaxy, and Peacemaker an opportunity to thrive, which proves that the thousands of characters, whether well-known or obscure, have potential to generate billions. Certainly, there is a lot of mid-level content that doesn't get widespread attention, such as Doom Patrol and Legion. And there is a fair amount of debatably bad content, such as the entire output of the Arrowverse, the moderately baffling Moon Knight, and the campy Riverdale. However, these examples, both good, bad, and indifferent, are simply a sign of a medium proliferating. Some translations will work, and some will not. It's just the law of averages. Regardless, superheroes or comic-based movies and TV have saturated popular culture. Much like the Silver Age, in the late modern age, the term comic book has become synonymous with the word superhero. Although, if one examines the medium itself, there is a variety of genres and themes represented. Superheroes may be the dominant genre, but there's a fair amount of space for other genres to succeed. The internet in general has had a noticeable effect on comic books. Every company in existence offers digital versions of their print material. Initially, most companies would withhold digital copies of their new releases to give comic book stores a sales window. This way, the print version wouldn't compete with the digital version. Over time, that window has gotten smaller and, in some cases, has ceased to exist. Sales figures for digital versions are not publicly available, so it's hard to discern the exact effect these virtual copies have on the print industry. The preference between print and digital is likely a debate between comic book fans that will continue well into the future. In North America, another debate erupted online about comic books. The debate revolved around the diversification of characters and their integration into mainstream titles. However, the word debate may be too generous. In actuality, it was an argument, a rather vicious argument that seemingly split the fan community into two distinct type of fans. There were those that either supported diverse characters and their representation, and those that preferred a traditional approach to superhero content. The latter position was easily translated into various social phobias. 
Creators and editorial staff were openly maligned for their perceived agenda. Some creators, who expressed support of a traditional model and criticized modern practices, found themselves unemployed. This led to the conspiracy-driven accusation that editors and publishers were forcing their open-minded views, political alignment, and their opinions on their audience and talent. And the talent were expected to agree with these positions or face repercussions. It was further argued this alleged agenda was having a negative impact on the industry. This, air quotes, debate led to a polarizing of comic book fandom. There is a distinct division between the two sides. However, it mirrors an equally present social atmosphere in modern culture. In the end, comics are a medium that have faced a variety of challenges through its existence, whether that be a literal censorship board or the general misperception that comics are trash. It has evolved from a primarily dispensable form of entertainment for children into an art form that can incorporate fine illustration with literate prose to produce something distinctly unique. Or it can be crude, but sublime, silent and cartoony, or overly rendered and bombastic. There is no one correct form a comic book can take. It can be any style or any combination of styles and still be a comic book, and that makes for a powerful medium. Yet, its acceptance as a valid art form and source of entertainment for all ages is a somewhat recent development. But one could argue all those challenges, perceptual and otherwise, shape the medium into what it is today. Classically speaking, restrictions have always forced creative people to find a way to express themselves accurately or truthfully in their art. And comic books have been no exception. This is all reflected in the history of the medium.